Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And it's good to be with you uh, this morning. Thank you, Mary, for playing this morning. Uh, all right. As we have more people moving in here, let's um, let's look at announcements real quick. Um, coming up September 13th, uh, which is a Sunday, I will not be here. And so uh, this is kind of so new for me. This is my first Sunday. I won't be here. And so I, I wasn't quite sure who to contact and who to make aware of that, but I'm not sure what you guys do on your on your days where your pastor isn't here, but um, I will be from the 8th to the 15th, I will be in Fayetteville, Arkansas for a course on doctrine and um, doctrine and polity, church polity, church, church government, so um, that is going to be, uh, it's taking up a lot of time at this point, but anyway, I'm not going to be here on the 13th, so need to find somebody to fill pulpit or whatever you guys do when you don't have a uh, pastor around. So, and then um, coming up in October, uh, I've already given a letter about it to, to Mike this morning, but um, there will be a four-week series, sermon series on stewardship, uh, looking at stewardship as a holistic thing. Uh, exploring stewardship with the saints is what that's what that's going to be called. Now this week uh, I will not be in staff in the Stafford office at all. Uh, Tuesday I will be in Hayes, and uh, Thursday, Wednesday I will be at St. John all day. And Thursday I will be heading to Hutch, to the district office with um, both the St. John and Stafford secretaries for an orientation there, and then Friday I will be going to. Uh, a mentoring a thing in Waukini, and so I will be in the St. John office just early in the morning, and then by mid-morning I'll be gone from there. So just to get you, uh, make you aware of those things, it really kind of makes it tough when they say I have to be gone so much, but anyway, uh, just, just keep those things in mind. Uh, if you need me, don't hesitate to call. If it's an emergency, for sure don't hesitate to call. Flags are used to represent the 
earth and by all things of, uh, in heaven, bringing Central to the theme of the window. The Holy Spirit window was placed in the ancient church in the name of Jesse Bowden and Hiram and Emma Kidd. Jesse Bowden was an elementary Sunday school teacher and Hiram and Emma Kidd, the great grandparents, Roger Hiram Russell, the designer and builder of the windows. In the event the church should be closed, the windows should not be sold but be relocated for the heirs of Roger Hiram Russell. This Holy Spirit window was dedicated during the 100th anniversary service of the Anthem Church, uh, April 26, 1981. Uh, that's funny, I wrote these down several years ago and uh, still stutter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this, uh, I wanted to kind of review what, what we have. It's not a dove that we hunt, but it's a dove that represents God. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. That's a descending dove, a dove coming down to the land of the Lord after his baptism. Thank you. Um, there is a, a note here from Emma. I should read to the family. To my Antrim family, I just wanted to thank you all for the wonderful donation to Sustainable Roots. I also wanted to thank you for always supporting me on my crazy adventures. It's so great to know I have your prayers and love wherever I end up. I love you all so much. Thank you again. You have no idea how much your donation helps. So we're glad we're able to help in that way. Any birthdays or anniversaries this week? Sherilyn's was Monday, so we celebrated that one last week. this week? Okay. So we will move on to our call to worship. If you would stand, please. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they go through the valley of tears, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also forever they go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O oh Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give the ear of God and Jacob. Behold our shield, O oh God. Look upon the face of your anointing. And please remain standing for hymn number 514. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Oh, 
So most people could speak English, but most of the worship was not in English. So almost every song was in Zulu or Kosa. So when I was just singing this song, I was like, man, I know all these words. <laughs>
in half, if not more. Good. And it's a different hurt from the needles, but it's not the pain that he was having. So we're hoping that it'll work and relieve his pain and that kind of stuff. And just continue to get better and stronger. Okay, help me with his name again. Clyde, Clyde Bush. So. And the doctor made a mistake in telling him he could ride a tractor and my mom and sister went no. <laughs> And hopefully that kind of pain that he has now will go away over yeah. time. And they thought it was from the needles going in to do the procedures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike had mentioned uh, Chuck Young last week, and I went I went and visited him yesterday at his house, and uh, he has started chemo treatments. He's done like three, I think, so far. And so we need to keep him in his prayers. He has a long road ahead of him. My mom had some major health issues this actually a week ago, Sunday evening it started, and so I've been back and forth to Wichita all week, and we're looking at probably a few more weeks, so I would really appreciate prayer, and um, it's complicated by the fact that my mom takes care of my dad who has dementia, so when she has problems, it, <coughs> it doubles everything, and so I would, their names are Marvin and June Gates. I really appreciate prayer. We've got to figure the whole situ living situation, treatment, and so forth. So it's a baby. I will. There's one more um, prayer concern. I'd like to ask prayer for um, Escarino family. Emma Loss, a really good friend this week. Escarino. 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 Um, Emma lost a really good friend this week um, to a motorcycle accident in Wichita, and he was camp counselor with her at Camp Horizon, and it's been a very difficult week. Please be mindful of, of those uh, from our congregation um, who are in the care homes um, and also from our community that we have on our prayer list as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, once again, we are grateful to be here in your house to worship you, to um, sing together and pray together and um, to fellowship together, to hear your word. We ask, Lord, that you would open our ears and our hearts and our minds to receive the word that you have to share with us this morning. Lord, too, we pray for our sister churches, and we ask, Lord, that you would help them to prosper according to your will and, and desire, um, both here and abroad. We thank you, Lord, for the report from Chelsea of her experience in Africa, and, um, and I pray, Lord, that the, the, the seeds of teaching and experience that you have sown in her life would, uh, would grow to bear fruit someday. Um, thank you, Lord, for the testimony of your good work there. We pray for several people, Lord, that... Um, have health issues, and we uh, want to remember Clyde Bush with back problems, and thank you, Lord, that he has um, had this uh, procedure that uh, appears to be, uh, have had a positive effect on his situation. Um, we also um, ask, Lord, your continuing, continuing uh, ministry to, to Chuck Young, who's undergoing Chemo. And then for for June's health and uh, and her care of her husband Marvin, we ask Lord that uh, you would uh, you would minister to them as well. Father, too, we want to lift up the Estorino family. Um, 
who had lost a very dear friend in a, in a motorcycle accident, which uh, we asked, Lord, um, that uh, you would minister to them and provide the care that they de desperately need in a time like this, in a sad time like this. Now, Father, as we continue in our time of worship, we want to remember how you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please turn in your hymnals to number 405.
revealed the mystery of his will to bring everything under the authority of Christ, who sent his spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing your inheritance. Paul keeps you in his prayers, asking God to enlighten the eyes of your heart so that you may know the hope to which you have been called, the riches of his glorious inheritance in all the saints, and his incomparably great power for all who believe. He desires you to have the power of God in you, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that not even death could overcome. Paul goes on, to explain how dead you were in your sins when you used to follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The evil spirit that was at work, that is at work among the disobedient. But God, who is so rich in mercy, made you alive with Christ even when you were dead in your transgressions. By grace you have been saved through faith. Grace being a gift from God, not from yourselves, not earned by your good works, so that you can boast of saving yourself. Rather, you are made holy in Christ Jesus in order to do good works which bring Him glory. You now live at peace with God and your neighbors because He has broken down walls of dividing walls of hostility between us. You were built together with all the rest of us into a new kind of temple a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. This temple is called the church. It is a, mis a mystery that the only people to understand it are those to whom the Spirit has revealed it. And just to make sure that we understand, Paul asked the Lord to reveal it. That being rooted and established in love, we may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that, surpa that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul explains that after we have been filled with the Spirit, we are now able to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. God has given us leaders to equip us for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We must take off the old self, the old fleshly self, and repent and put on the new self, the spiritual self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We must flee from all evil behavior, from speaking evil and thinking evil. There must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity. God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. It is shameful to even mention what these people do in secret. Live as wise, not as unwise. Be filled with the Spirit, not soaked with wine. Sing and give thanks to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Lay down your life for her. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Children, obey your parents so that you will have a long life. Employees, obey your managers with respect and fear and with sincerity of Christ. Just as you would obey Christ. The Lord will reward every one of his followers for doing good, whether you own your own business or work for someone else. He doesn't show favoritism. Then Paul concludes his letter writing about spiritual warfare. This familiar passage um, on the armor of God begins with a couple of assumptions that we need to keep in mind. Paul wants to remind us, first of all, that there is evil in this world. It is real, and it is very powerful. And secondly, he wants to remind us that God is more powerful than evil, and because he is good. And he has given to us everything that we need so we may stand against the devil's schemes. These two points being the thrust of the Apostle Paul's uh, conclusion, the main idea is that he wants you, the audience of his letter, to remember as you depart from the meeting place where it is read in secret. 
Remember, you are all outlaws because you are here worshiping Jesus in the first century, listening to the words of one of his apostles. Let's take a look at those two points that Paul makes in this passage in Ephesians chapter 6. First, he emphasizes that there is an evil force of darkness who works day and night to outlaw what we have come to know and believe and practice, to cause us to do what our Lord has instructed us not to do. He desires to help us cause us to shy away from doing the good that we're called to do. The power of evil is real and working to sabotage, sabotage all of us and keep us from doing the kingdom work. Whether we recognize this evil has declared war on us or not, it has. It's a lot like um, some people in their understanding of, of terrorism in our day. That worldwide terrorism has declared war on anyone who um, uh, cares about peace and freedom. This battle that we face is not against flesh and blood. We can't point to an individual and say, he or she is our enemy. Although there may be many that we might imagine very well could be. But nothing happens in this world of the flesh that does not first happen in the world of the spirit. Our struggle is against spiritual rulers, against spiritual authorities and powers and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If we approach these kinds of powers with fleshly efforts, we are wasting our time. Yet for many Christians, the first thing that they do is point out all the sins or wrongs that other people or organizations or governments are doing, saying, we need to stop them or persuade them to change their mind. So, but the truth is, you must fight fire with fire. If the enemy is a spiritual enemy, then you must fight in the spiritual realm, not necessarily in the flesh. Unfortunately, popular opinion associates evil with a figure in red pajamas and a forked tail in our culture, which leads many people to discount the entire concept of evil at work, work in the world. It's interesting, they, they don't have any problem uh, understanding uh, in Star Wars that there is a positive force and a negative force, a, uh, a force of light and a force of, of darkness. But when it comes to real life, they want to deny the existence of Satan. They want to deny the existence of God. Many actually view the devil as a, a cool guy whose purpose is in life is to prepare a place for us to party for eternity. A tempting alternative to playing harps while sitting on fluffy, fluffy white clouds for eternity, which also is a deception. These are, of course, are lies. They're, the devil is the father of lies, the, the deceiver. See, this battle is being waged in the realm of ideas, the thought life, the, the spiritual world, a place where motives and desires are formed even within our own hearts and minds. Our enemy is real. It is powerful. We cannot win the battle we face with fleshly weapons. We cannot win without the use of spiritual weapons without the use of spiritual weapons given us by a powerful, spiritual, and good God. Weapons through which His power flows to us. So because we are attacked by the power of evil, we need the strength of good God to protect us. That leads us to the second main point that Paul makes here at the end of this letter, that the power of God is fully capable of protecting God's people against evil and devilish schemes and is available to all God's people. Notice what protects us. The metaphor is of a suit of armor. But protection comes from truth. A belt that holds everything together without truth. The rest of it just falls apart. 
justice and righteousness. Something that is put inside us because of what Jesus did. Peace. Our feet are fitted with the readiness of, of that comes from the gospel of peace. And faith is a shield that extinguishes the arrows of the evil one. And salvation is the helmet that protects the most vital organ of all. Our brain. Our thought life. And the two offensive weapons that he provides is the sword of the spirit. God's word. The Bible. And even with this protection... We are encouraged to also use a second weapon, and that is to pray. Not only for ourselves, but for other believers. This isn't just rhetoric for Paul. He is persuaded that praying for one another and the connection among believers is part of what makes us strong. A faith community is stronger than the sum total of its members. It might also be known as uh, synergistic strength. And Paul, an ambassador for God that he is, knows that he needs the communal strength and prayers of the church at Ephesus in order to do what he is called to do. To strengthen the body of Christ, we pray for one another. And we remain strong in the Lord as individuals who, so that we can do the work, the collective work that God has appointed us to do. Why? Just so that we may stand. I want to use uh, a, a story to perhaps help us understand and illustrate this for us. Uh, there is, if you've been paying attention to my Facebook posts lately this week, um, I've sent a couple of them about uh, a Christian camp in Central, Cali or, yeah, Central California up in the mountains called Hume Lake Christian Camp. And uh, um, every year... This camp uh, has, um, I'm sorry, every week during the summer, this camp has about uh, a thousand young people go through their camp every week of the summer. This is a huge camp. Um, they have um, fourth through sixth grade camp, seventh and eighth grade junior high camp, and then a high school camp. And um, along with that, there are, uh, there's a subdivision of camp cabins that are up on a hill, and then there's the staff housing as well, and, uh, and then uh, there are other campgrounds around that area. But anyway, it's, it's near or adjacent to Kings Canyon National Park, and they have been fighting for their life. It, this camp has been fighting for its life the past couple of weeks. They're calling it the Rough Fire, uh, which was approaching the camp from the east. The, the Kings Canyon uh, actually runs, the Kings River runs north and south on the east side of this, this camp and this lake. Uh, and it has a basin that's up above the, 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 uh, this, uh, this canyon on the east side. Of it. So as you're driving in to this basin, this lake basin, you're seeing out and down into the thousands of feet into this canyon. Well, the, the fire was, had crossed the river and was coming up the other side and um, uh, toward, toward the, the dam itself. And so um, it, it, was, it was just a, a, a very scary situation. Anyway, I was... Uh, uh, I was just made aware of it just this last week, early this last week. Um, and one of the things that they started to do was they started a burn on a north-south line um, about 20 to 30 miles long um, back toward, they had a favorable wind, and this was just the last couple of days, they had a favorable wind to, to, to burn back toward the, uh, to, toward the fire. Um, and... Uh, hopefully burn up that fuel so when it hit that it would just stop the fire and um, and so uh, they they were able to burn up to about a thousand yards wide down the canyon along the line running north and south and then they also had some water lines that that had been set up all the way around the camp and the campgrounds and they had some flame retardant retardant uh, covering 
uh, just a portion of the, of the south end of the camp uh, to protect some of those key buildings in the camp, the, the uh, cabins and so forth, places where people live. So they, among those things, they also use this fire to fight the fire. But the most important thing that, that I have discovered over the weeks with, uh, when talking, or over the days, with, through talking with people uh, closely associated with, with this, was that um, the most important weapon that they were using was prayer. Now, I was a camper at Hume Lake some 40 years ago, and some 30 years ago I spent a couple summers up there working as a staff person. And everyone that has any kind of contact or association with this particular camp has been praying. And literally hundreds of thousands of young people have gone through this camp over the years. Everyone has, uh, has had, that has any kind of contact has been praying, knowing that God has the power over the elements of the earth, as well as uh, against spiritual forces of evil that may be driving that fire to destroy a camp that has done so much for the glory and the purpose of God. In the past couple of days, Hume Lake Christian camps and campgrounds and the cabin subdivisions have emerged from the immediate danger of the fire. The servants of God are still there, and the trees are still standing as well. So to review and, and, and kind of connect this, um, Even 30 years ago, they trained us, when I was a staffer, they trained us how to fight fire. What we're going to do in a case of a fire approach that. And it's important that, that we take that example, uh, understanding that we may not feel or sense or even know that there is an enemy that is fighting against us right this moment. But we need to be prepared because we need to know that he will if he has it. That there is a situation uh, that we are all facing that requires us to be properly equipped with the armor of God, properly prepared to utilize the weapons that he, we have been given, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer. Evil forces have been trying for years to destroy this church. You can believe it. He is at work still. And so I want to encourage you to make sure that you're wearing your armor daily. To study your Bible. To know how to use that sword when the time comes. And then pray in the Spirit all day, every day. And remember to do all of this so that when the day of evil comes, you may stand.
Lord, that what has been said with our lips, we may believe in our hearts, and that what we believe in our hearts, we may practice in our lives, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.